Welcome to the Creators here at Sun City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by art making what you make. Today on The Creators, Mark Dole is a filmmaker and animator who has brought his own family's drama of medical challenges to the screen. And today he adds farmer to filmmaker and father as his family moves to growing food and animals in rural New Hampshire. So we invite you to subscribe and give us a thumbs up. Well, you got to watch the show first. So here's Tommy. Hi, folks. Welcome back to The Creators. I'm Tom Jackson, and we are here, as usual, in uh, our studios at Sun City in beautiful downtown Summersworth, New Hampshire. With us today, we have a uh, filmmaker extraordinaire uh, from the Portsmouth area uh, by the name of Mark Dole, who has... Uh, uh, directed and produced uh, many uh, a great film that uh, we're going to be talking about today. And so welcome to The Creators, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, the way we often start off the show, um, you know, it's called The Creators, and uh, I think creator has become kind of a, a word that a lot of um, uh, artists of different types mm -hmm. use, uh, particularly, though, content creators. Yeah. Um, and so, do you consider yourself a creator? And you know, what if anything does that term mean to you? You know, it's been so tough because uh, not tough, but you know, early on um, in my career, I was really interested in computer graphics because computers were it's tough to believe. Thirty years ago, computers were just starting to work with video, and I was just a computer brain, and um, they made sense to me, and I totally jumped into the computer graphics portion and started doing a lot of work with animation. Um, and then that turned into other things and multimedia and everything came after that, and web development and everything. Um, so really, when I look back at everything I've been doing, um, it is creating, but it's really creating stories. So a, a storyteller. Because no matter what I'm doing, if I'm not telling a good story, and I don't do you know, artwork or anything like that, I wish I was talented enough to to, to do that um, painting or anything. Um, even if I did a painting, it would be telling a story. And if, if I'm gonna be making a film, I want to inform or educate people and tell them a story. I, I want them to get through to the end of it. So in, you know, in more recent years with everybody getting more into shorter form content, um, you know, in the early 2000s, I was starting to create media that was three and five minutes long when everybody said that's way too short. So then, then it just you know, flips around, it's shorter stuff now and everything. Um, but what I've found is uh, I've liked recently in the last two years creating stuff that's, well, slow cooked. I, I got into um, you know, agriculture and farming and I'm dressing for the job I want to have as a farmer. <laughs> yep, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, as looking in, in that area and and farming and agriculture and and just loving food, and realizing that the best tasting food I've had has been locally grown or or and or slow cooked, not rushed or anything. And in watching some films, I mean, I've given friends hard times for making two-hour films or enjoying three-hour films. And yeah, okay, I, I, I rib them for that. But there is enjoyment in longer format things. Um, there's more and more mini series that are uh, now available online um, with any of the different streaming services. And you, know, you binge watch them. Okay, so years ago that would have been called a six hour movie. Now that's a that six episode, one hour mini series or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So. Um, you know, the whole t the whole time frame with everything and the content uh, being shorter or longer, it's really about the audience. And on some of the new things I'm trying to work on, besides the farm, um, have a short and a longer form component. There's a three minute version that people get interested in online, and then the half hour version that is me just stumbling over everything. Because hmm. um, as I'm working on this Becoming a Farmer series that I'm doing, 
um, that might never get completed because that's the issue we have when you have ADD is uh, you start working on a bunch of things, but you might not always finish them. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, <laughs> well, and farmers work their asses off all day long, yeah. right? So you know, and you then at night, at night, I'm like, oh, oh, I got to import the footage I shot today. <laughs> Oh, and I got to edit it. Oh, right. yeah, I forgot about that. And my back that. hurts. <laughs> and my back hurts. Oh, oh, and that smells yeah. like chicken poop. Yeah, uh -huh. that's chicken poop. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so uh, you, you have all these different things going with uh, the type of story that you want to tell. Um, and I think that there are audiences out there for both of them. And I've been blown away by you know, watching a lot of YouTube videos of farmers and seeing the good, well-produced, three to five minute segments that I'm learning something from. Yeah. And I've started, I shoot stuff when, when we've been doing it um, over the last year. I shoot stuff for that. But, you know, like filmmakers, we leave the camera running all the time. Um, and there's a lot of gems sometimes in, that you have to cut out. And sometimes it's just that slower pace of just watching stuff. Because I'll send a five-minute clip down to a friend or my sister, and um, uh, they'll say that this is great. Why don't you just release this? I'm like, well, I'm not re ready to release it. I don't know what the story is. Hmm. Um, so it's like I'm making daily three to five-minute clips, but I'm not sharing them with anybody yet because I want to put them into this bigger thing later. Because I want it to make sure that people have a story at the end of this, not just all right, we found a house in Gilmington after a year and we bought a farm. Yeah, this, this is sounding very cinema verite. Is, is that kind of what you're, uh, yeah. what you're doing here stylistically? Yeah, I mean, um, if people have seen the, the film I did, Mido Kids, which is a, basically home movies of, of my family, that goes over, um, at that point it was 22, 23 years of having... Um, two kids with special needs, uh, seizure disorders and everything, and then having also two daughters that were deaf and diabetic. Um, you know, uh, as you look at that, it's all home video and then an interview here or there. And when I went to film school or communications school, you know, we called it film school, but we didn't have to pay the lab fees, so we got out for 12 grand a year cheaper. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, we would watch Boonwell and all these old documentarians and everything like that, and they'd just make these, these great pieces um, and just looking into other people's lives. And in some of the, like, even the corporate videos I've done for medical companies, mm -hmm. when we have to go, I fly to Texas, I interview this, this uh, family, their kid has this rare disease that there's only like 300 other people in the U.S. that have it. Um, I love finding out what other people's stories are, so that the verite, the fly in the wall, you're just here, you're seeing it. Um, that's always intrigued me, because when the camera's off, typically, that's when life happens. But if you leave the camera on all, all the time, or enough, you get a lot of life. Yeah. Um, and in the Mido Kids film I did, I was... Uh, I had some parents reach out and say that I was exploiting my kids, and um, I took that to heart. Uh, I didn't like that people thought I was exploiting my kids. Um, and there was a couple of those. The thing was is there was hundreds, maybe a thousand, mm -hmm. but there were hundreds of people that thanked me because I was basically telling a story similar to theirs. Right. And it was the weird things that you see, not all of us talking about the seizures and the medical this, medical that. It was the funny little things of, um, you know, we can't fly because one of my daughters will always need oxygen and it's a pain in the ass to get, uh, you know, the TSA to work with you and get oxygen on a plane. Mm. Um, so we drive. So we've actually had more interesting experiences just driving around the country. Go to uh, Texas or uh, St. Louis to visit family, Florida to visit family. Um, my wife's truck has 360,000 miles on it, and it's, it's only 10 years old. And we, we've done wow. a couple of trips to uh, uh, St. Louis and many trips to uh, Florida just for the kids. And you just get to see everybody in between, in between all the cities. And, 
you know, the flyover country and everything like that, and you get to know people. Um, we've been at restaurants where people will look and they'll see that, you know, my older two daughters, they have epilepsy. You really can't tell they have epilepsy or anything like that. They look pretty average. Um, then when one of them, the second oldest, had a stroke and she doesn't talk and she'll make some odd noises and then some people start to stare and look over at you. They'll see us signing to our other daughter um, and then they'll say like, oh, are you from a special needs home? No, no, that's just our house. This is our family. And you get talking to these people. And we've had people pay for dinners for us. Hmm. Actually, I've never been there when they've paid for dinner. It's always been my wife or my mom. I, I guess they see me and they're like, oh, he can pay. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that story that is just, um, it's not the regular story that everybody would tell if they're just coming to meet you for a day. Sure. This is, you know, this is a year long investigation into what we do day to day. Yeah. And I've had friends that have, um, you know, visited and they'll, they'll say something to me about, oh wow, I, you know, when, when they're at the house they notice something that they've never seen in a video or anything like that that I've done. And I'll be like, wow, yeah, I really should include some of that. I really should include some of the, the card game that we play or, um, you know, the doctor's visits or just every week we have to go through this big basket of medicine and, you know, put it down into pill boxes for two kids. Yeah. And you know that's an event every week at our fam at our house. Yeah. And we try and do something else around it. Uh, sometimes it's it's done at a at a park and ride as we're driving you know from New England down to Florida, or sometimes it's done at the, my daughter's college dorm or something like that. Um, and uh, those types of little stories that come out of the mundane parts of everyday life are. What's intrigued some people? What's Absolutely. Nice? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if you uh, subscribe to this kind of rule, you know. I mean, in, in filmmaking, at least my understanding of it, you know, there, there are some kind of like strong, strong suggestions, uh, or, or maybe somebody yeah. calls them rules sometimes. Yeah. But, of course, you, it's a, also a creative art, so you can, you can kind of like throw them away and try something else yeah. uh, anytime you want. But... It seems like, especially in documentary filmmaking, there is a little bit of a cardinal suggestion anyway, mm -hmm. that you try to show people something that they've never seen before. Right. Even if it is within the context of, of something mundane like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and Cinema Verite, and shooting lots and lots of footage, I mean, we've got Frederick Weissman right down in Cambridge still making films, mm -hmm. and he's, you know, uh, notorious for shooting hours and hundreds of hours of footage and then going into it and finding the story that he right. wants to tell well, rather than the other way around. And that's how um, my family is because it's like every day I just shoot something and I'll send a video and I'll do a little bit of voiceover to the video so my mom or my sister or some other friends know what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis but that's probably not the voiceover that would make it into something longer that I do once I've figured out a story. Mm. Um, but like when I'm doing longer format documentaries, especially like, you know, the, the, the one I've been working on kind of for six or seven years was um, I did a film called In Danger of Being Discovered, which I interviewed all these bands that I had followed around for, for many years in the early 90s when I was trying to become a music video director and they're all trying to make it into the, into the music industry. Um, I, I went back and I took all this footage. I, I had... I don't know, was it uh, 48 hours of footage from all these bands? that Nobody had ever even seen most of this stuff, except for me and a couple of friends that shot it with me. Um, so there's all of this information there, and I'm like, uh, let's see what's up with these people. Let's, let's do this little nostalgia piece. I go out, I interview all these people, and you know, I, I um, reconnect with a lot of people I haven't heard or talked to in a long time. And... Um, Throughout the film, I mean, Michael Venn and I, who made the film, we knew a couple of people that were just going to be the centerpieces of the story. Mm -hmm. And we kind of framed when we were going to interview them around when we interviewed other people because we knew we wanted to get corroborating information or 
uh, you know, information about what we should ask this person when we finally get there. So Jeff Bibbo was the one that we ended up, we kind of knew he was going to be the lead of this because we had followed them in the 90s and you know, they were the band from the area that everybody really loved. Um, so we kind of saved his interview for last and after we shot his interview, we're just blown away with this was more than we thought and this was everything we wanted for a film. So what was it, six months into the filmmaking that all of a sudden everything changed. We changed the name of the film, we changed the focus of the film on and you know, reunited two of the bands. Other bands were reuniting at the same time and other people were getting together. Um, so it felt great to have a little part in all of that. And after that, I just kept hanging around with, with Groove Child and, and Jeff Bibbo as they were making this new album, their third album that everybody always wanted them to make. And I helped them make a Indiegogo video. I, I went to all these different concerts. I shot a bunch of different concerts with them. But I was always trying to shoot music videos for them. Um, well, Jeff passed away earlier this year, the week after they finished mastering the album. And we'd had a good friendship, um, got a, very close. Um, I named my farm after, you know, after Rock, Rockwall Farm, after the project we worked on. Mm. I choke up about that all the time. Um, so uh, he had a great impact on my life. And uh, the day after his funeral, um, or the memorial service, uh, I was going through clips. I had made a new video that nobody had ever seen the footage and everything like that of one of the new songs that nobody had ever heard. And the video after that was something somebody else shot of. It was an interview of Jeff and I after the New Hampshire Film Festival. And was, you know, they said, Jeff, so what are you up to next? He goes, I don't know. I just live my life and he makes a film out of it. And when I heard that this March, I went, holy shit, I still have to make a film. I mean, when Jeff was alive, the idea was we were making pr promotional videos for the band. Yeah. Now I'm looking through six, seven years of footage of shot in recording studios. Basically, I'd go in once a year and shoot some footage in a recording studio. Uh, you know, all sorts of things, spinal tappy type of things happen. You know, one day, there, two days, there was no power. Um, one day, the other members of the band didn't show up, all sorts of stuff. Um, so I'm going through that footage now to try and find the story. What's the story? I, I was out there trying to make uh, music videos to promote the album, but now the album needs something else because the band isn't all around to help promote it. Brian, who's uh, the, the, the other co-creator of the band, Brian Killo, He's been doing an amazing job moving everything forward, but I still feel this need to help finish telling Jeff's story. Not just because of him, but also, um, was it, um, I know what it was, I just have to not choke up. Um, Van McLeod, who was the head of the film commission for many years, passed away a few years ago, too, actually. Um, before he died, and actually way back into when we originally did the In Danger of Film, In Danger of Being Discovered film, he kept on saying, make sure you follow the band. Hmm. So I'm like, here's somebody that's always been a mentor to me, always helped me get through story ideas. I'd share a script with him and be like, really, you want to spend the time making that? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, that wasn't that good. Um, so he's always been a, a, a good bit of feedback. And, you know, he, he was saying, you know, this is something that you should be, you should be following. Um, you know, he passed away the year before Jeff, so or two years before Jeff, so he didn't know the way everything happened. But I take what those two guys have said to me and go, all right, Jeff wants, or he wants me to follow Jeff, and Jeff is like, I just live my life and this guy makes a story. Mm. So there's a little bit of pressure there, but I also go, that's my purpose to have all this footage. I mean, I, I have hundreds of hours of footage, and I've talked to a couple other fans that have photos and, and live recordings, audio recordings that people have never heard. It's like, okay, this is a band that was only popular in this area, but it's a great story. Yeah. And that's one of the things I want to work on. And yeah. same with my family. Um, you know, we did the Mito Kids documentary 10 years ago. And over the past few years, we've been talking, what is the update to that? 
You know, the kids are doing different things now. Um, it's wholly different having 27 and 29 year old daughters that live at home and are special needs. And, you know, we now have to go once a year to re-sign and re-up for custody. We have to have the state come in and make sure our house is fine to have the custody of our own kids. Um, it's a kind of an interesting thing and my wife works for a, a community service organization and uh, yeah, she deals with hundreds of families like ours and us telling our story in any way, small way, really in depth or whatever has at least informed other families and helped other families. I mean, I know two or three families that have directly thanked me that live in this area for things that they learned from our documentary and then my wife helped them out with more services because she was able to talk to them through her work. Um, and now living on a farm and having to deal with 50 chickens, six turkeys, two rabbits, two dogs and a cat, I think I got everybody in there, um, uh, I, I walk around a lot. I walk around the farm a lot and I'm doing a lot of work you know, with gardening and all that stuff. And what I do is I just put the audio version of interviews um, onto my iPad or iPod and just walk around listening to that mm -hmm. just to re-ingest everything that went on because just sitting there watching it, hey, I've got no time to sit in front of a computer anymore. Um, I, there, there's some weeks where I don't even have it turned on and I'm like, who am I? I, I was the guy that always left his computer on and now the thing hasn't been on in a week. Mm. Um, so I'm always listening through stuff and like even listening to some of the recording sessions, I'll listen to everything going through and then I'll hear a little, a, a little mention of, oh, let's redo that take because I don't like that and we should double up on this. I'm like, okay, great. This is something specific that he's talking about to make the song better and this is the type of information that you want if you're, making, if you're watching a documentary about how this album was made or how this band was absolutely there's all the times where he goes he touches his tongue and through his hole in his uh teeth he's lost his tooth and you know four or five times where, where he's got that and he's like yeah we need to start the indiegogo campaign so i can you know get a new tooth and you know the irony there is the first time i think we talked about it said my dad used to be a dental technician and he would make the false teeth and everything and um he goes, yeah, I got my first false tooth in you know, 90 whatever. And I'm like, well, my dad might have made that. If you got it in Durham or Dover, mm -hmm. my dad might have been the guy that made that. Um, so it's interesting to, to go over how little stories connect there. Um, but you, know, you just hear the different little bits that just start to ring into, oh, this, is, this connects to this, and this is going to be how the story would come together. Or this would help become the segue for that other story. Um, yeah. And like the project I, I was working on with you for a while um, was just a lot of listening to interviews. It's stuff I didn't know yeah. much about. Um, and that's the other thing is I gotta listen to this so I understand all the, the, the subject matter um, yeah. and then start to go, all right, now if so-and-so said this about the boat industry and so-and-so said this about the fishing industry and then this is about climate change, they're all together and they need to be shown together. They're not just three separate statements about different industries. These all work together. Right. Um, and you got it. And it's like, all right, these three interviews go together and, uh, you know, make sure we remember that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it sounds to me like you actually have uh, two kind of slow cook things going. So becoming I, a farmer and Jeff's story. Yes, um, and the becoming a farmer one is a, a potential two-way track um, because there's, you know, there's been the whole move. I mean, having special needs kids and we sold our house uh, in July and we didn't move into a new one until November. And, you know, so living through all these Airbnb places through seven months was horrific. But I videotaped everything. My wife and I go back and watch it and go, oh my God, that was a horrible, horrible. Oh, wow, that was funny. Oh, you remember that? And all of a sudden we're laughing about stuff that was a pain in the ass to live through. Sure. But this other stuff was going on. So um, 
so the, the farm thing, and this is where it gets into how long is the format. Because I've gone, as we've started the farm, I don't know anything about farming. I've bought a bunch of books. I've been reading a lot for the last couple of years. Um, first, I've been reading stuff besides software manuals in a long time. Um, and start interviewing other farmers and learning from them. And does that, you know, that could be its own project on it. It's pro a project on its own. And then there's still my family. Um, they all work together, but how long of a piece does somebody want to watch? Do they want to watch me boiling down maple syrup with a guy and then coming home, having a tough night? I make myself a Moscow mule with a really good ginger beer that I love and a really good copper glass with the lime the right way and with lime that we grew and everything like that. Nice. And yeah, that's been awesome having fresh limes at the house. Um, so the line that we grew, and then everything inter being interrupted by a seizure and a trip to the ER. That's my life, um, but not everybody wants to see that. They might just want to see the maple syrup part of it. But I don't. But that's not what I want to share. Right. I think the whole story is fun. Yeah. But it's also taking me longer, just because I got so much to do. Sure. Um, it's taking me longer to cut things down. So right now I have. I, I take every video that I've shot, I just put it in a timeline that's progressive, and uh, you know, all right, there's three hours of footage from May. Wow, okay, so what does that get cut down to? Um, you know, there's you know, only five minutes from July or whatever, you know, so, so there's all these different things to think about there. Um, and uh, I've been saying a lot lately, as soon as that first snow falls, we'll see how how heavy I'm going to be able to get into this stuff, but yeah, um, it's been great having people come visit the the farm. I've had a lot of people I haven't seen in years just want to stop by. I I used to joke that they just wanted to stop by to give me a mental health check. Like, you really want to do this farm thing? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. I mean, one of the reasons we started a farm, besides you know the the health benefits, was um, being a parent of special needs kids. You kind of have a PTSD. Mm -hmm. It's not PTSD like a soldier would have, yeah. but the, a thud in the night could mean somebody fell out of bed and had a seizure. The other night, we're all in the living room, or in, sorry, in the kitchen, talking about things, everything's fine, and my older daughter, Brittany, had a seizure. And when she has a seizure, she just, she curls into a ball and falls. Well, she mm. landed directly right there, mm. and black and blue, blood everywhere, mm. had to call EMS, the EMS police chief actually lives across the street. So EMS was pretty quick. Um, and it, you know, everything uh, changed our day based on just that one seizure. Yeah. And that's the reality check that you get when, when we put some of this stuff together. Well, you know, when you were describing that scene of, uh, of working on the farm all day long and making yourself a nice drink, uh, yeah. Uh, at the end of a day, uh, and then it's interrupted by a, a, a necessary trip to the ER. Um, you know, to me, this is just my opinion, but to me, although I don't like the fact that <laughs> you had to go to the ER and things like that, from from strictly looking at it as a film, it, the fact that, that that reality that comes into it mm. kind of cuts through the sort of, you know, because, I mean, the... People have a notion, and, and most people probably have seen television footage in a, a TV news magazine or something like that of this, this beautiful, idyllic life that, mm -hmm. that a farmer is living, mm -hmm. right? And, and nothing cuts through that sort of veneer or whatever you want to call it to really show them you know, the reality. These, mm -hmm. are, these are people, and things happen, yeah. and, and life may not be as, as uh, beautiful and idyllic as it looks. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times I, I kind of reference the hard work that they put in, you know, and mm -hmm. people don't seem to realize that, you know. Same thing with, uh, I've, I've done some shooting uh, up in New York, Maine with some lobstermen. Yeah. Um, you know, they work their asses off yeah. all the time. And, uh, uh, you know, but to an outsider, they don't really necessarily see that. But, and they also don't see whatever's happening in their lives. Yeah. So, uh, you know, from a, a filmic perspective, you know, I th I think that that's that's giving your audience a lot more to be able to show them. Mm -hmm. You know, that that reality. Yeah. Um, 
and, it, and it's the reason I go back and forth with, should I just release a five minute video every week or should I wait till I have a bigger story? Um, because, I mean, be, I'm pretty busy, so that's one of the reasons I'm not on social media. But one of the other things is, um, sometimes my posts are just too much about the kids. And I, I love the outpouring of love that people send when you post something about Brittany having a seizure or having trouble. But um, I was inundated with other emails and calls and everything that were all from amazingly well-meaning people. But this happens to me every week. Hmm. I just posted it because we were in the ER. But every week that exact thing happens. And it was the first time we'd ever been to the Concord ER. So it was all these different things going on about it. Um, so um, I, I've kind of stepped back a bit from social media because all the comments just, they just seemed to be like pity sometimes. Hmm. And I don't think people, and people don't mean it that way. They're yeah. truly meaning they're sorry. But you don't want to hear I'm sorry, I'm sorry all the time. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I even had one person that kind of trolled me one time and because uh, uh, I was, it used to be when the kids would have an issue, um, I would, i take photos all the time. And when the kids would have an issue, I'd have to be sitting with them. So I'd just be sitting on my phone. I'd get on Instagram and go, oh, what a picture have I taken lately? Let's make a nice photo and post that. I actually had somebody look through my social media posts and I was working on a project with them. And I said, um, oh, I can't do it this week. I've got such and such going on, this is going on. And they said, well, on this date, you posted this picture from Bristol, Vermont. And on this date, you went this. I'm like, I wasn't actually in those places on those dates. And by you doing that, it just, you know, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I guess it's, I don't know if it's selfish of me or, or whatever, just not, you know, I want to share the story on social media, but I don't want everybody to share stuff back with me. Yeah. And I can understand that. And. I love it when people need help. I've been helping, let's see, two, three, four relatives of mine. I've kind of um, helped adopt in some ways, just as a as a figure of somebody that they can call and talk to their issues of what's going on with their, their immediate family, not just a distant cousin or uncle. Mm. Um, and. That's been really rewarding is that one-on-one -on -one help with people. Um, and if somebody has one-on-one -on -one information or discussions, I'd love to do that. Um, and, and I actually help other people by telling them other people's stories. So that storyteller aspect of being able to go, well, I have known people that have been addicted to heroin or addicted to opioids. I mean, one of the toughest things on the day that um, we buried Jeff Bibbo from Groove Child. I, did, I had no idea this was about to happen. I mean, I grew up in Newmarket, so going to the Newmarket Cemetery, you know, I, I, I wasn't thinking of anything, but I lived in that town. Hmm. After we placed everything at, in, in Jeff's headstone, uh, I looked up and I saw the name of a close friend from high school. Uh -huh. And I just turned around and I couldn't believe it. And I turned around and saw the name of another. Hmm. The only two friends of mine from high school that passed away are right here and here, and Jeff's in the middle. Um, my best friend, uh, Scott, he, he was a friend from college, so he grew up in Rhode Island. He had passed away about 10 years ago, and he knew uh, he was passing away from uh, multiple organ failures, from multiple complications of surgery throughout his life. Um, and he was kind of the person that pushed me into just start making films again. Because it was always, hey, let's do this, let's do that. It'd be great if we did this. I, at the time, I had aspirations of doing an you know, animated feature film and everything. And Scott's like, I have a year, to, year left to live. What can you make that I can watch in a year? I never made anything in time. Um, but two movies I made afterwards, I dedicated to them. Um, but having the knowledge of what these people went through and being able to talk to a cousin and tell them what other people have gone through with opioid addiction and or, or other drug addiction or or just mental health issues um 
helping somebody understand what somebody else could be going through. And the funny thing is, um, you know, so we moved to this new town. I didn't know anybody there. Um, and we, when we met one of our neighbors, an older couple in their 70s, um, I brought over a dozen eggs and I said, you know, that we're, we are their doles, we live over here, we just started this farm, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I got talking to them and in, in, the, in 1981, they had moved to that house to start a farm for their family. They don't have a farm now. It's, it's, an, it's a great house, gorgeous kitchen, very love their kitchen, jealous of their kitchen. Um, but I love to cook, so. Um, and, and they have a, a pool that they're thinking about covering over, but that pool used to be part of their field. So it's like, you know, they've just, they're done with the farming stuff. Um, their kids are all grown up and now they travel everywhere. Well, they went into their attic and brought me a stack of books like that that were all about f organic farming, um, but they're all from 1980. And I start reading these things, and I'm like, this is the same stuff I'm reading about now, but they're just not saying things like, oh, a heritage breed of turkey is the kind of turkey you want, mm. which is what we're talking about now with um, when you want to get a better tasting turkey or one that's not so genetically modified and everything like that. And m they taste so much better. Mm -hmm. um, but... You know, it's interesting to read these 30-year-old books, and they have very similar information to what they're saying now. They just weren't talking about heritage breed stuff, but they were talking about, or they're actually talking more about wind power, not solar power, but wind power and how to, you know, how to get enough um, electricity out of a windmill at your house to run whatever you need. Yeah. And uh, it's been pretty interesting to talk to them, and it's like, wow, I'd love to interview you guys about your farm. We've been hearing from Mark Dole, filmmaker and farmer yeah. now, uh, and uh, absolutely encourage our viewers to uh, to go to Vimeo um, and search Mark Dole. It's Mark with a C. Yeah, Mark with a C. Uh, and D-O-L-E. Um, and check out the incredible work that he has done. Uh, so thanks again for being with us here on The Creators. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. All right. Give us a thumbs up, folks, if you uh, are so inclined, and uh, help to spread the word. If you can link this, uh, pass it around, and uh, also subscribe. Um, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time on The Creators.